Welcome to ICANX Youth Talks, Young Scientists Shaping the Future. My name is Martin Thuo. I'm coming to you from North Carolina State University. Today, we'll be um, hosting Boyce Chang from Iowa State University and Gujan Liu uh, from Chinese University of Hong Kong, Shenzhen. Our first speaker is um, Gujan Liu uh, from Chinese University of Hong Kong in Shenzhen. She is a, an associate professor, and she, she has been working on uh, uh, flexible electronics, and she's going to be talking to us about that work today. Shenzhen, go ahead. Share your slides. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marty. So I will share my slides. Yes. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Martin, and thank you, Professor Zhang Zhi, invitation. And uh, it, it is an honor for me to be here to share our research uh, uh, to, with the audience. So today, I would like to share our uh, recent re research on the neuroinflammation biosensing device and the Parkinson's disease early diagnosis. As Martin said, I, I came from the School of Medicine from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Shenzhen. Um, before I joined this uh, institute, I was working in the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Uh, yeah, my uh, I did uh, my PhD with Professor Justin Gooding uh, in University of New South Wales in Sydney. So today, basically, my talk included in four parts. The first one is regarding uh, basically some introduction for the Parkinson's disease, and then followed by the neuroinflammation and the cytokines, and then we will share some recent results. Uh, on the in vivo cytokine detection. Finally, we'll make a summary on that and what is our future on this neuroinflammation monitoring. So firstly, uh, before I go to this um, regarding the Parkinson's disease, I would like to share with you guys what's my, uh, my team's research interest. Basically, my team is focusing on uh, development and advancing sensing technologies uh, uh, for this disease monitoring to create tools to quantify our health. And uh, then we try to realize the big data towards dig digital health ma uh, management. In order to achieve that, we are focusing on three types of device. That is a uh, uh, microfluidic biochips. And also we are uh, doing this uh, wearable biosensing device. Uh, and also we will do this in vivo biosensing monitoring device. And meanwhile, in order to increase uh, the um, the performance of this device, this sensor device, we also uh, develop some intelligent nanoparticles to uh, help our device have this desirable performance. So eventually, this device we would like to uh, generate the digital signals. That signal eventually will um, uh, translate to an electronic one and uh, stored in the clouds. Eventually, we realize the e health and the cloud diagnostics. And eventually to choose this kind of quantifying our health. So uh, basically, we are trying to address three scientific challenges. The first one, all our sensitive devices, we are trying to uh, address the sensitive and the specific bias sensing. We are trying to apply this biotechnology and nanomaterials technologies to achieve this very specific and uh, sensitive detection eventually. Uh, we would like to achieve the single molecule detection. The sensitivity is 10 minus 18 mole, that's concentrations. And also we would like to address the in vivo continuing monitoring through our biosensing devices. And the main and targets that we are focusing in cytokines, that is also part, main part of today's talk regarding these cytokines, how we can realize in vivo continuing monitoring of these kind of molecules. And eventually we would like to integrate this sensing device together to realize intelligent diagnosis uh, for that. For example, we apply this uh, smartphone or personal equipment to realize digital signal readout and quantification. And so uh, as today, we are focusing on talking about the brain disease. So we know the brain initiative started at 2014, that is from uh, um, Obama, right? So that the brain means brain research is through advancing innovative neural technologies. So for us, because uh, we, uh, I'm working in this biosensing area for um, almost 20 years, so we are trying to develop some new technology, especially biosensing technology, for monitoring the neurochemicals in our brain, try to do disease early diagnosis, and uh, eventually, hopefully, can do the guide this therapy, eventually treat our brain-related disease. 
Uh, so uh, for this neurodegenerative disease, the one of us we are focusing on is Parkinson's disease. As we know, the Parkinson's disease is very popular a uh, disease um, uh, in America and in China, especially in China with this progress of the aging uh, this is, um, uh, in China. So the population increased uh, very fastly. For example, now, I mean, one in 500 people affected by these conditions and although it can cause by the loss of liver cells in the brain, the main symptoms is just like shaking or sh uh, slow movements, stiff muscles. So the tricky thing about this disease is uh, when you diagnose it, this person have these symptoms, this disease, I mean, you just can't make it uh, go back. You only can do something to slow down this disease progression. So that will cause us, we early diagnose this disease, early provision, and this uh, better management is essential for this disease. So uh, according to the um, uh, clinical research, the brain um, damage is caused by the activated microglia cells. As long as these aggregated microglia cells, they will generate this inflammation. This inflammation through secretion, this kind of the uh, cytokines. So for the brain degener uh, degenerative disease, the main symptom is this uh, unbalanced pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines. So normally, these pro-inflammatory cytokines overshadow these anti preferent uh, cytokines. So they cause this brain different type of brain disorder the disease. So that, for example, the Parkinson's disease as Hammer's disease. So that's the problem. So then we also realize current the challenges for the Parkinson's disease is clinical symptoms that based on based on the clinical symptoms that is poor specificity and also higher means uh, these diagnosis conditions and also they can do the tissue biopsy in the clinic that is a very invasive practice it's not desirable even now we can use a, a, a very expensive PET scan for this disease early diagnosis however it's very time consuming very cost a very higher cost, not a general, uh, this kind of, especially for these people living in the resource limited areas, they don't have the resources to do that. Another dilemma for the current Parkinson's disease is a lack of, of the specific biomarkers for this disease. And also low specific drug can really treat this PD disease. So then we think about, can we find the coordination between the neural inflammation and the Parkinson's disease development and the progression? So this is real nice. We would like to focus on one type of the molecules, that is cytokines. What are cytokines? Cytokines are small proteins. They are single molecules between cells, especially the immune cells. They are indicated the functional state of the body, and also there are many um, diseases, biomarkers, such as Parkinson's disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and sepsis, also related to that. And also we know in our body, the immune system, we have the balanced this kind of static pro inflammatory cytokine and the anti inflammatory cytokines. So, we, our body needs inflammation. However, even the unbalanced inflammation causes problems. So, we know the main player is cytokines. So, this further uh, justifying this class of molecules is very essential and critical to our health. So, for example, currently we know these many uh, chronic diseases, for example, cardiovascular disease infectious disease, and also autoimmune disease, even the very current popular one is depression. They are highly related to cytokines, the unbalanced cytokine levels in our body. So also we just like they almost puzzled us for three years, this public, uh, um, public disease, uh, the, the, the health problem is uh, uh, um, this COVID-19, right? This is SARS-CoV-2, this is cytokine storm. That is because this kind of uh, imbalanced uh, inflammation in the body, that is a, a pro-inflammatory cytokines overshadowing the anti-inflammatory cytokines. So that all these kind of facts guides us, we need to do something regarding this type of molecules, the diagnosis. Uh, we are interested in this uh, um, in cytokines, I show this table here. As we know, from this table, we can see two uh, uh, phenomena. One is the molecule weight of this molecule is small. And also, there are proteins. The uh, molecule weight is below 50 kilo. And another thing is that in health people's body, the physiological concentration is below 50 picogram per mil. So this requires us, we detection this type of, uh, the class of these molecules is challenging. 
because it comes from the no biological concentration of these type of molecules. And also, they have very dynamic secretion process. Another thing is they are distribution in our human body in, in homogeneous. And another very important uh, uh, phenomenon for this type of molecule is that we have formed this very complex set of little works. That means when we body have one biological symptoms, does not mean one cytokine can play the, that. That is a group of cytokines. They work together to form this uh, phenomenon. And also, that's why it requires us, we need a developer, very sensitive and specific assay for real-time localized monitoring this type of the molecules. Especially, we need to realize multiplex detection and also possibly we can re realize minimal sample volume. That is because this molecule, if we want to focus on brain related disease, the brain fluid that is a CSF, that means it's a very small amount. How we can realize this uh, diagnosis in that small amount of samples? So this is, requires us to do something to, uh, to realize this study kind of monitoring. So we, uh, my team is studying for the study kind of detection since uh, 2015. So, uh, so far we have developed a serious study kind of monitoring assays from email bias sensors to the abdomen sensors, that is through two-step assay to one-step assay. And also we realize from intracellular cytokine detection to extracellular cytokine detection. And also we realize this point of care cytokine diagnostics. And also we can have the in, uh, uh, the in vivo device for real-time cytokine monitoring. And also we have nanosensors to implantable device that is all related to cytokine monitoring for quantification. So um, today we are specifically focused on in vivo medical device development to this brain disorder the disease. So uh, these two examples for us to uh, realize in vivo cytokine monitoring. For this, we uh, realize, provide a solution to monitoring the specially localized concentration of cytokines in specific locations. Uh, that is, this device can do that. Basically, this is uh, optical fiber that we fabricated the optical fiber because the tiny of this optical fiber, they can approach uh, our uh, brain and even the spinal cord areas here. So uh, today I'm uh, using this as an example to, uh, to describe how we can realize this uh, cytokine sensing based on the optical fiber. So basically we have optical fiber and then we do the surface modification. We modify a layer of nanomaterials that is to increase the surface area to uh, uh, modify a uh, maximum amount of the capture antibody of a target cytokine, for example, uh, uh, interleukin-6. After that, we form this sandwich assay and then the detection antibody with the fluorescence. And then we can uh, realize the signal readout that is a fluorescent signal. And the beauty of this design is because this um, um, optical fiber is longitudinal structure. So that means that we can do uh, the different, especially uh, localized detection. For example, we have one uh, and location for one centimeter, right? So that means this, this part, the set kind of level is higher. That means this guided the doctors, we need to do something to treat that specific part of that. That part of the inflammation must be high. So the attractive point for this device is can do this brain uh, can do this uh, spinal cord monitoring because the spinal cord current in the clinic, no way to know which spinal cord have inflammation. Normally in the clinic, they just do total concentration of the cytokine uh, um, detection to know the whole amount of the inflammation. If we have this device can be applied in this spinal cord. That means they can guide the doctors to know specifically which part of the spinal cord have inflammation. So basically, this picture is showing the confocal image of the optical fiber. You can see the green dots that shows they have cytokines look like that. And we, uh, through this, this uh, scanning, we can form, uh, we can transfer this 3D optical fiber fluorescent signal to the 2D fluorescent signal. Then we can do quantitatively monitoring the cytokines based on the uh, intensity of the fluorescence. So based on that, we can generate this uh, um, uh, calibrating curve that is according to different concentration of the cytokines, they increase and then the uh, fluorescence signals will increase. And then we can realize this uh, detection limit is 1.2 picogram per mil and the linear range is uh, kind to higher to 500 picogram per mil. So this is used for the interleukin-1 beta, this uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. After this uh, ex vivo, I just in vitro, 
uh, demonstration. Then we can further apply this device to the in vivo monitoring. So we fabricated this uh, optical fiber sensor device. We shipped this device to the University of Colorado in Boulder. So this is Dr. Barata. So they are interested in the, the drug treatment of this uh, brain to see if this animal, what is the physiological performance. So they wanted to monitor the cytokines secretion uh, in this uh, brain um, of the mice, uh, the mice after this uh, treatment or drug treatment. So normally these mice were wearing this cannula and then we can specifically insert our optical fiber device inside and then we can leave it there the, as long as you wish for like one hour, four an hour, or, or overnight. Then you can take it out and they, they also this animal can move around. So that is we can realize this in vivo, uh, real time, uh, just like provide the uh, specific time period of the cytokine uh, secretions. So uh, we can see here, and uh, we are uh, using the SPS to stimulate this um, animal. And then we can monitor the cytokine levels after one hour and after four hours. We can realize that after one hour, compared with uh, control animals, the cytokine levels, especially for IL-1 beta, increased significantly. And uh, however, after the four hours, this uh, cytokine levels uh, lower down to the background levels. Not showing or suggesting this animal's immune system, they are uh, able to uh, do this inhibition of the inflammation just to lower down the, uh, the cytokine levels after the four hours. And also for another point of view, we can see our device can really can pick up the in vivo uh, conditions I uh, I uh, into looking one bed has con uh, the the uh, the levels so can we can see this uh, secretion levels of in this uh, brain uh, in vivo conditions and this is just like a control experiment showing after the treatment the animal body actually their diseased condition they lost the weight and also we can see which areas this optical fiber can insert it in so this is the results and uh, uh, shows that we very promising in vivo device can do this different uh, monitoring of the in vivo cytokine levels. After that, we continually apply this device to the spinal cord, considering the optical fiber they are fragile and it causes safety issues. So we replace this optical fiber with the uh, with the stainless steel, and this stainless steel we just do service treatment and do service modification, and then we can do have realize the similar immune sensors on this uh, stainless steel, and then we can easily uh, insert our the stainless steel based immune sensor inside of the spinal cord of the animal with these guiders of this uh, cannula. And they can live there for a period of time that you 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 like. So this work is collaborated with Professor um, Hutchinson in University of Adelaide. So his group is especially interested in the uh, uh, neuropathic pain. So they are using the cytokine levels to quantify the pain. So that means they can use this device can quantify the, the pain levels and level one, level three, level uh, level four, something any anything like that, just to realize the pain quantification. And so why this study can also related to the pain? As we know, if our bodies have some uh, damage or some uh, uh, some diseased situations, then this part, they have this inflammation and the study can levels will be increased. And also this kind of levels will, uh, will transfer through the spinal cord and the central uh, uh, sensation system and it tears the brain. This part has some problems and they have the pain. So that's the uh, cytokine levels is highly related to the inflammation and the pain. So then after that, we would like to uh, interest in the uh, Parkinson's disease. So we developed the implantable electrodes for cytokine monitoring towards this Parkinson's disease diagnosis. In this um, study, we replace in uh, we replace this signal readout uh, from. Uh, fluorescent monitoring to the electrochemical uh, signal monitor because we want to realize the real time monitoring. So basically, we have the implantable electrodes. This electrodes uh, fabricated this immune sensor, and then this electrodes is can be inserted in the brain of these diseased animals, and then we can do uh, three cytokines simultaneous monitoring. Uh, for example, here interleukin six and interleukin one beta, 
and uh, TF alpha. So th this is three pro-inflammatory cytokines. According to the clinical studies, they are highly related to the Parkinson's disease. If this uh, Parkinson's disease um, uh, have this symptom, these uh, patients, uh, the, the blood levels, these three cytokines are increased. So that's why we choose these three cytokines to guide that. So eventually we would like realize this device, like if the animal can wear in this wearable device and then we can keep on generating the cytokine levels and then we can, uh, uh, can collect it through our mobile phone computers and can do real time monitoring for that. So based on that, this hypothesis, we realize this in vivo device evaluation based on the, the saline control and the shine operation for these animals. So from this study, we can see here, we have mice group A, that is the saline clone group. And also we have the uh, mice group B, the shum operated control group. And also we have the LPS stimulated group, that is um, Parkinson. also we have deep uh, uh, Parkinson disease models. So from here, we can easily, we can realize that. You can see we have three cytokine levels, TF alpha and uh, 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 interleukin one beta and interleukin six. So comparing with uh, the controlled, the shrunk operated, these animal models, LPS stimulated levels, the TF alpha, and these three cytokine levels, they are significantly increased. And also for the PD models, they also increased. So this uh, study uh, demonstrated two points. One point is this in vivo device, electrochemical device can pick up these in vivo conditions, cytokine levels, and also can pick up three cytokines simultaneously. Another one is further uh, justified or evidenced that in the Parkinson's disease uh, animal models, these three cytokines are really, uh, their levels increased uh, uh, in this kind of diseased animals models. So as we know, we realize this uh, immune senses, that is a two-step assay, right? So we can have to firstly, we have the capital in the face, have the uh, antibodies here, and then we attach the antigens, and then we exposure this device to the detection antibodies uh, with this uh, uh, signal readout, label the signal, so we can realize the electrochemistry, fluorescence, or any other uh, signal re re readout. So how we can realize this one step, uh, say, just like we have the cytokine levels, then we immediately provide a device. We, we, we just immediately get the cytokine level. That means we can we will not have any time delay regarding these neural inflammations in our body. So that is we can realize the electrochemical immunosense sandwich assay to this one step based on structure switching DNA abdomen based real time sensing. So, uh, so basically this strategy here is principle is we have the rigid this type of these molecules and uh, modified our sensing interface as uh, this DNA. And then we label the reduction probes at the end of this DNA with the presence of the uh, target analyze. This DNA will do the strict uh, 3D structure switching. They will molecules they will uh, this will do the go back to the original situation where uh, far away from our electrode surface. And then this electrochemical signal will recover uh, uh, will be um will be uh, released. That means it disappeared again. So this is uh, help us to do this continuing monitoring of this, uh, uh, the cytokines. So based on that, uh, um, this kind of principles, actually we have demonstrated this uh, device in our in our electrode surface. We can mon uh, monitor the three cytokines simultaneously based on this device. So in the future, we're not just uh, focus on this only three cytokines. As we know, the cytokines works as group. That means the one uh, uh, one disease, for example, the Parkinson's disease, probably have the twelve or twenty cytokines. The the segregation levels significantly enhanced. So how we can realize this like a uh, twelve or twenty cytokines monitoring? So we are doing this uh, realize this kind of monitoring through this steel optic fiber. If we can realize optic fibers. Can even we put these bundles of optical fiber inside of the uh, animal's brain, and then if they have cytokines there, they will show us the optical signals out. So this is real nice. We can do this continuous and uh, simultaneously. This multiple cytokine monitoring can really, uh, based on this one, we can really can understand what is the relationship between the neural inflammation and the progression of the Parkinson's disease. So the neuroinflammation 
uh, basically is related to all these kind of cytokine levels. So through the comparison, the cytokine levels through the uh, healthy uh, animal models or disease uh, PD models, then we can see what are the cytokine levels. They can significant the difference. Then hopefully this kind of a study we can secrete it out. What are highly potential biomarkers of Parkinson's disease? And what are the uh, contribution of neural inflammation to our Parkinson's disease uh, development and progression? And also this kind of the study also can help guide the future treatment of the uh, Parkinson's disease. For example, if we realize this pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory levels increase or something like that, we can uh, develop this, uh, we can have this, uh, know these acceptors or something like that can help the drug deliver, uh, uh, development uh, researchers to develop uh, uh, specific drugs for the Parkinson's disease. Uh, so yeah, that is all I would like to share with your uh, the audience. And also I'm very happy to uh, have further discussions in the discussion sections. So before I end my talk, so I would like to um, uh, uh, have the acknowledgement to my team and, and currently in uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong at Shenzhen. And also I have to appreciate these uh, fundings that I got uh, in Australia and in China, and also uh, some industry fundings to help us to do this uh, satellite monitoring, especially for AstraZeneca, this company. So they are uh, the pharmaceutical company to develop the drug. They are, uh, we have a collaboration for more than two years for monitoring the cytokines because they would like to us provide the point of care device for monitoring cytokines. Hopefully they guide, uh, guide them if the drug is good or not because they want to monitor the cytokine levels in a very fast way. Normally they monitor cytokines either three weeks. They say, can you realize this like in, in like uh, 10 minutes or half an hour can give us this guidance like that. So really appreciate this uh, funding from these uh, 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 the industries. So uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your fantastic work. It's uh, great to see what you're doing in diagnostics. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Boyce Chang. <laughs> Boyce Chang is an assistant professor at Iowa State University and is really talking to us about his work on uh, self assembly. Voice. You can share your screen, boys. Thanks a lot, Martin. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation to speak at ICANX. Um, one quick thing is I can't activate my video. If but yes, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Martin. Uh, again, I'm Boyce Chang. I'm a new faculty at uh, Material Science and Engineering Department at Iowa State University. Today, I'll be talking about directing self-assembly of nanomaterials, uh, focusing specifically on block copolymers, and we'll see why. Um, before we start, uh, I'd like to quickly introduce everyone to Iowa State University. Uh, we have a beautiful campus. We're located right at the heart of the Midwest in the U.S. And we have all four seasons, which is good and bad. Um, and particularly the material science department is housed in this building here on the left. Uh, we're a relatively small department, but we're growing. and uh, just a heads up to all the students out there. We're actively seeking for students, uh, both undergraduate and graduate. So I highly encourage everybody to apply. Now, let's talk about nanomaterials. So there are generally two ways to, two approaches to synthesize nanomaterials. And first one I'm going to talk about is top down. So, top down approaches, uh, we are generally very good at. All of semiconductor are built upon top-down. Photolithography is a huge example of top-down nanofabrication. And it's great because it's easy to dis dis design. Excuse me. <laughs> it's great because it's easy to design. However, 
uh, we are very limited to two-dimensional order. If you pay attention to all the features that are shown here. And at the same time, nature demonstrates that it's very easy to get three-dimensional order if you use self-assembly. And in fact, you can do this at nearly all scales, starting from macro materials like butterfly wing to bacteria and viruses, all the way down to the molecular scale like DNA. Which brings us to block copolymers. So block copolymers are one of the simplest forms we can make use of self-assembly. Uh, you might have heard of block copolymers being used as uh, thermoplastic elastomer. In fact, that's one of the largest industries that uses block copolymers. Uh, they, they're used for micelles. They're used for photonic crystals because they self-assemble at the wavelength, close to the scale of wavelength of light. And more recently, there's a lot of interest in using block copolymers for semiconductor fabrication. Uh, so block polymers are polymer chains that are that consists of several, or in this case, two chemically distinct monomers. And what happens is that they phase segregate into these nice nanostructures that we see here. Uh, for example, spheres, cylinders, gyroid, and lamellae. And another thing that's neat about them is that you can you can control Control the different structures by changing the volume fraction of each block. And you can control the size of these features by controlling the molecular weight. And so, generally, when we talk about block polymer self assembly, what we're really referring to is this phenomenon of microphase separation. So, because the two blocks are chemically distinct, they try to avoid each other, but they cannot completely phase separate because they are covalently bound. And so we coin the term microphase separation. And again, depending on the size of your molecule and the volume fraction of each block, uh, you self-assemble into different nanostructures of a particular size. Now, one problem in Block polymer self assembly is that while you have short range order, so these domains are molecularly defined. And so if you look at an SCM image here of a block polymer, a lamellae phase block polymer, uh, throughout the entire material, the domain spacing will be very precise, will be kept constant. However, in the long range, you do not have orientational control. So it appears random, like a fingerprint. But if we would like to use self-assembly of block polymers for making devices, whatever it may be, we would need to achieve orientational order. And this is an example of that. So how do we achieve that? How do we achieve orientational order in block polymers? Well, a general strategy to do that would be something known as directed self-assembly. And just to give a brief overview of what directed self-assembly is, I'm going to use a very typical block copolymer, uh, polystyrene block polymethyl methacrylate, PS block PMMA. And let's say it has a predefined molecular weight. And so the domain spacing will be kept constant at L0. And let's call it this. So imagine the red block is polystyrene and blue block is PMMA. And so what I would do is I would chemically pattern on a substrate lines that are commensurate to the domain of one of the block. In this case, I'm showing polystyrene, but they're not exactly in the same dimensions just because at these scales, uh, it's very hard to pattern. And in between the two sparse patterns, I would put a neutral filler where both blocks can exist. And so what do I mean by that in three dimensions? Well, first, we have a substrate and we graph polystyrene uh, 
chains on top of that. So now I have a polystyrene preferring chemistry. And through lithography, now I remove parts of the uh, polystyrene brush. And the only section I keep are commensurate to the dimension of my target block of pollen. Finally, I fill the spaces in between with a neutral brush. And now if I perform self-assembly of the blocko polymer on this substrate, what happens is that the polystyrene chain, the polystyrene brush now anchors polystyrene domains uh, along the entire substrate. And so what we get out of this is if I have my pattern substrate on the left here, we would have full orientational order of the blocko polymer. And we achieved this uh, because of the chemical grafting of the substrate. So that's just a general overview of what directed self-assembly is. Um, but so while that technique is very powerful for long range order, uh, it has a major limitation whereby, uh, because it's a surface phenomena, there's limited film thickness uh, we can apply before directed self-assembly stops working, essentially. Uh, so if in this plot here on the left, if we have film thickness on the x-axis, the thicker as we go at higher and higher film thickness, the free energy that we gain from directed self-assembly evens out. And so there's very little driving force between being in fully orientated mode, despite having chemically defined patterns versus defective states or random order. Now, just because the driving force is low, right? the delta F is low, doesn't mean that there's no delta F. So there is a delta F, however, it takes pretty much forever in semiconductor manufacturing terms to get full, full orientation order. Right? This process should typically take minutes, but now in this case, it takes up to three days. And that is certainly not acceptable uh, as far as manufacturing is concerned. Um, so the question is, why is film thickness important? Well, film thickness is important because when we're patterning materials using block of polymers, a critical step is etching, uh, specifically selective etching. So what we do is we apply a plasma etch, and one of the blocks will etch faster than the other, resulting in a pattern like this, where the quick the the block that etches faster, exposes the substrate beneath it. And what we would then use this for is like a mask where we can then etch the exposed regions. So if we do not have a thick film, what happens is we don't have enough mask material left behind, or we call it etch budget, to pattern the silicon substrate. So therefore, for block polymer lithography to be useful, we always need to have thicker films. And so how do we achieve that? How do we achieve thicker films and improve tolerance? But well, one strategy we can take is making use of the fact that polymer films generally have, uh, generally are able to host materials like act like a matrix, for example. And so what if we embed molecules that will chemically attach on the surface after self-assembly? And so in this case, again, I have the directed self-assembly pattern, just like before, neutral brush in between and polystyrene brush anchoring the polystyrene domains. Now, if I have molecules that will face separate into each distinctive blocks, and they have a chemical group that can attach on the substrate, can I then now create a one-to-one -one guiding pattern, basically enhancing the surface influence on the entire film? And would that then enable us to get thicker films uh, with full rotational order without the need of a three-day anneal? 
So the first thing we did was first to test the hypothesis. Uh, if we have uh, polystyrene films, right? And what if we do a second graph? Because to achieve what we just talked about, we would first need an existing brush and be able to surface modify that brush with a second layer. So this is FTIR data uh, on thin films. Oh, sorry, actually on uh, mono layers. And so we looked at first polystyrene brush and then subsequently see if there's any chemical changes after putting on uh, E-beam resist and it's fine and we knew that from the start. But the experiments came when we grafted a secondary brush on top of the polystyrene brush. And so I have that uh, gray lines in the cartoon signifying that we believe grafting has occurred but we don't see any changes in the FTRR signal. So we don't see the signature uh, C double bond O peaks. Even though the brush that we put in clearly has those monomers. And if now we use a longer chain, so I highlighted here in the cartoon, it's a shorter chain. If we use a longer chain and perform the same secondary graph, now we're able to detect that signal. So what we learn here is that grafting does occur if you perform a secondary graph. And the trick is you need your second brush to be longer. And that makes perfect sense, right? It has to be exposed in the surface to be able to influence the surface chemistry or the wetting. And we did water contact angles for all the corresponding samples and saw the same trends. Uh, water contact angle of the polystyrene film is 90 degrees. Uh, that's pretty much literature data. And we see that the polystyrene monolayer, the wetting of that film does not change until we apply that longer brush with the metal metacrylate group. So the first validation works. And the second validation we wanted to do is whether or not this same thing happens in a block copolymer. Because for that method to work, we would have to embed these chains into a block copolymer and then hope that they face segregate along with the blocks and then perform the secondary graph, giving us a position defined grafting. And so now this time we started with a neutral brush. So this is a neutral brush. A neutral brush is simply just polystyrene random copolymer with uh, methyl metacrylate. And so contact angle is approximately 70. And so if we do this, we found that at low concentrations, uh, we do change the contact angle significantly. And one big reason is now the molecular weight difference between the secondary brush and the initial brush is very high. And so even with at low concentrations, we see a change in the contact angle. Uh, we also measured film thickness through ellipsometry of the monolayer. And there's no significant change in the film thickness in this case, but tremendous change in the water contact angle, indicating that we are grafting some chains on. And finally, at very high concentrations of this brush, uh, we get an even higher change in water contact angle. It's pretty much the contact angle of polystyrene uh, and slightly more changes in thickness. So indicating that, yes, we are doing what we think we're doing. We're grafting these chains uh, selectively in the block copolymer. So we finally did BSA with this uh, chemically embedded brush. Okay, and so this is just uh, AFM and SCM image of the first pattern from eBeam. So these are lithographically defined patterns, and they have slightly different tolerances. Okay, so this so the block polymer should only correctly self-assemble at about 0.5 L9 because that's the dimension of the block polymer block. And we see that it's true when we have the typical DSA. So there's no, without any, what we call inks. So the chemically graph uh, molecules that I showed before, we refer to them as inks. And 
in that case, small changes in the dimensions of the uh, lithographically defined pattern will start giving you defects. In fact, in this case, you do not have any long range order at all. This is pretty much fingerprints. But once we have the one to one chemical graphs that we showed before, now we have full orientational order, even when the patterns are clearly very defective. Like in this SCM image, you can clearly see that some of the patterns are falling apart, but we can heal them with the chemical patterns that we applied. And then now for the final question, do we, are we really sure we're patterning one-to-one? -one? Like how do we know that this molecules that we apply are in fact repeating the pattern of the block of polymer? So we did a fingerprint pattern. Okay, fingerprint pattern meaning there's no lithography guiding. Uh, so it's just random orientation. But this film has the embedded inks. And so if it's doing what we think it's doing, it should then graph in this exact image uh, the, the chemistries, right? The distinct chemistries of PS and PMMA. So the idea is if I remove this film and I can remove this by using solvents and reapply a nail film, it should repeat the exact same image because now I have chemically defined my substrate as this film. And so we do that and lo and behold, we do get a replicated pattern. Uh, it's not perfect. So the answer to the question is, yes, we do have this one-to-one -one guiding at each block, but it's not perfect. And we know it's not perfect because the concentrations that we use is limited. As we know, if we embed too much molecule into the block of polymer, it starts influencing self-assembly. And last thing we did is uh, to analyze the lineage roughness uh, of the films. So the way we would do this is we would take SEM images, uh, convert them into these lines by doing image processing, and we would get information about the width, the line placement, and the line edges. So once we get those data, we would then perform a Fourier transform. And so what we get is a power spectral density as a function of frequency. And these different frequencies correspond to features of different sizes. And the three sigma here is uh, the ever, the uh, <coughs> this values that we get from the power spectral density. And so the important finding here is that uh, with the inks, and that would be the sample here we call it the thick SRSA, we call it the self-registered self-assembly. We're able to replicate the same roughnesses as when we're using a thin film. Now remember, thin films are usually better just because it's closer to the surface. There's more surface influence compared to a thicker film, or, which is closer to bulk. And with our chemically defined inks, now we're able to replicate the roughness values in a thin sample. And another thing to highlight is that uh, even though with the addition of the inks, we're not seeing significant changes in roughnesses, which is something we're a little bit surprised about. And so the last thing that we wanted to demonstrate is pattern transfer. So we're doing all this so that we can have enough edge budget to then finally transfer our patterns to the silicon. And so we will demonstrate that by first doing an oxygen etch selectively. And PMMA etches a lot faster than PS. Um, and if you have enough thickness, then you have enough etch budget to, to see these patterns. And from these patterns, we would then apply a hard mask, in this case, uh, aluminum atomic layer deposition, and then etch the remaining PS layer off. And now all I have is the alumina. And using the alumina as hard mask, now I etch the exposed silicon layer. And now finally, I have transferred my pattern into a silicon. So general conclusions here is that we demonstrate that we can further register the substrate 
when we embed these inks. And we have improved thickness values, tolerance, and line roughness. And we show that pattern transfer is possible without topographic defects. Now, I just want to quickly acknowledge my team. So most of this work is done at, uh, actually all of this work is done at the Molecular Foundry at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, that was where I did my postdoc. Uh, I'd like to thank my team, especially my advisor, Ricardo Ruiz, uh, Whitney Liu, who I work closely with on this project. She's now faculty at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison and Bei Hung Yu as well. And thank my undergrads for all their help. Our collaborators from uh, University of Chicago, Paul Neely and Western Digital Lay One, and folks at the organic and the nanofabrication facility. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, boys. Uh, great to see the wonderful work coming out of the lab. And all right, uh, so now we move to uh, final discussion. And, uh, take a few questions, and I think I'll start with the uh, Guzen. Uh, very fantastic work, really, really good. Um, <laughs> and I, I was I was very very impressed by the depth that you go into some of these methods of analysis, and and to be able to get such sensitivity is a, is a very very impressive. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah and, and, and then uh, I had a question. Um, in, in your work on the uh, uh, in one b detection, mm. you showed you showed some data where I, I noticed that uh, the, the, the error bars were increasing as you go to high and higher concentration. Yeah, yeah. So in looking one beta, yes. Yes. Is is that something that is associated with a secondary phenomena? Or is it because uh, you're pushing the the, the 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 way you sample? Or what what is the source of those oh, those so increasing error bars? Under the calibration curve, we generated in the um, phosphate buffer solution. So just okay. in the buffer solution, we added the different level of the uh, the cytokines, and then we okay. make the fluorescence. Then we can get that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, so so is that because of the buffer, or maybe there's a, a screening effect? On the you mean the bigger error bars? You mean mm -hmm. yeah. The big error bars comes from the uh, the, the fibers. When you find oh, okay. fibers, yes. Yeah. So because this is stabilized, the bottom up yeah. fabrication. Sometimes the fibers your fabric is not so homogeneous. So the cause ah, okay. issues. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very very nice. And then uh, also the, the the in the in the second part where you're doing the uh, interleukin one beta release. Yes, I, I, you, 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 you were using modified steel needles. Uh, we modified that, uh, you mean the, the second part in the electrochemistry part? Yes. Electrochemistry where, where you Where you were using the uh, steel needle. Uh, steel surface, needle. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that is yeah, the spinal cord, right? Spinal cord. Yes, yeah. Spinal cord. That so, is a, yeah, st st uh, we fabricated the stainless on the stainless steel surface. That's like a needle, exactly like a needle, just like a. They 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 go okay. the spinal cord over the the mice, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how how strong? What is how stiff are those uh, those fibers that you're making? You know that uh, you know that one is not the optical fiber. So that mm -hmm. for the insert the brain one is a hippocampus one is optical fiber. But for the spinal cord, we try we originally would like to use optical fiber. But when we through the cannula, it's easy broken. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we change it to the um, uh, stainless steel. So this stainless yes. is uh, as uh, you know, the um, what is it? The, that that a company making the, 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 the device for the uh, cardiovascular device. So the company yeah. they're selling this kind of the stainless steel. They can mm -hmm. spiral compatible. They put it, they can put it in the body. We use that as that okay. uh, substrate. Yeah, yeah, and, and then uh, actually, it's very nice that you, you mentioned about how the the, the 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 fibers would break easily. Yes, because you know so, sometimes when you present results like this, especially for young faculty, you you feel like, oh, I want to get that results very quickly, but no. the failure rate. <laughs> oh, that doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah, yeah, for the brain, it's okay because the brain you only send that uh, hippocampus only like one millimeter, so that is mm -hmm. okay. But for yeah. the spinal cord, uh, you just you can't. You will have to. Okay. Use a robust stuff to realize okay. that 
yes, in vivo detection. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very, very nice. Uh, thank, thank you very much. And, and then the, the, the other question I had for you, and, and maybe we can, for the sake of the audience, the people who are out there. Yes. You know, it, 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 we, we see young people, very ambitious, and they want to solve big problems, like, what are you doing? But then uh, they get frustrated. Mm. The language is different. Yes. Too many things you have to deal with. Yes. You need collaborators. You have collaborators across the world. Right, hmm. you have people in Colorado. You have people uh, I don't know where else. You know, you're collaborating with different people. Hmm. So, for the young people who are in the audience, how do you get yourself into all these areas? You have to know how to fabricate. You have to know your uh, clinical side of things, the biology side of things. You have to work with collaborators across the world. How do you build such a big uh, yeah. effort? Yeah. So thank you very much for this question. Actually, this is a big question. Also, it's like a long life learning, long lifetime learning, <laughs> the process. Yeah. So actually, yeah. this is a quite a related cross disciplinary collaboration. So because currently you know, we are working on the biomedical engineering, the, the substrate, the major. So uh, the, the have to, you have to collaborate with different fields. You need to have the chemistry, you have the physics, sometimes you, got, you, 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 uh, you also need to have the uh, this uh, biology background, you have engineering, all these uh, uh, technologies or some background knowledge, you need to have it. And yep. the main thing for me, what I was doing is just like, I uh, normally I frequently go to the conference, I talk to different people, right? Talk to people and then we, we know different people I do different things. For example, yep. we are uh, working on the integrated device. For an integrated device, we need two materials. We need a biomaterials, right? We need a chemistry part for the assays, sensitive assays. And yep. also, we need the electronic part, that is uh, electronic engineering. That means you need a PCB board. This kind of, mm -hmm. this kind of knowledge, right? And the most important thing, you need to know these clinicians, some uh, biologists, the researchers. What is the, are they interested, right? What yep. are they the, the, the challenges, what kind of problem, the clinical problem they have. Even mm -hmm. we, we go to this kind of conference, expose ourselves to that environment, and then we can know different uh, researchers from different angles. Can yes. understand the same question in different way. So yep. for example, this kind of uh, optical fiber for the brain uh, uh, cytokine detection is uh, actually we, in a conference, I knew a neuroscientist. Uh, he just explained to me they are studying the neuro, uh, the brain activity, and they are interested in some uh, 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 neural inflammations, but they don't know how to measure it. Because for the ELISA, the ELISA they they, they need a, like a fifty minimum fifty microliter of samples, and also the sensitivity not normally is not that high. It takes a long time for that. Then just add because uh, like can you develop something for us? We can uh, uh, quickly get the response and can use a minimum sample. And even we don't need to get a sample out, we just put the device in and the, the, the solution is inside. That is the minimum amount of the samples and you get the response. So then we just yep. tried me, oh, probably we can use an optical fiber because it's very tiny, right? We just put it in and they have a sensitive device there. So this is just, I think, in summary, I think we need to talk with the people with different uh, um, fields, different angles, and then we can understand in the same problems, what are the different people's thinking and yeah. how we can uh, use our own expertise to solve their problem. So that's, yeah. I think, what I'm, I'm doing these years. But still learning, I guess we are long learning. <laughs> yes. Mm. Okay. Yeah, very, very, very good. So, and, and, and actually, let me follow up though, that, 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 on a similar line uh, to Professor uh, Boyce Chang. Uh, boys, you know, you, you show this really self-directing assembly system. And if I compare your approach to the top-down approach, which everybody has, been, most people have gotten very comfortable with. And I like your comparison with nature. Nature has no lithography. It doesn't have machines. It doesn't have all the kind of stuff we humans use. Uh, and, and to see you reproduce uh, features at such beautiful landscapes, uh, how do you bring uh, knowledge from the, you know from uh, what nature does, chemistry of the block polymers, designing the molecules to do the, the, the work that you're doing, the physics, and, and actually one of the things that um, uh, it was very clear in your work is the background thermodynamics that you know you have to know to be able to organize these materials. 
and also to understand surfaces and interfaces. How do you interface all this knowledge from so, so many different, uh, different backgrounds? And how do you even build it? You are, you are, you are a new professor, so how do you integrate all this stuff uh, to be able to do work like that? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Martin. I had a very good PhD advisor. That, that helps a lot. <laughs> Okay. Uh, for those of you in the audience that don't know, um, <laughs> Martin is my PhD advisor. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I think that's a great question. And, and I, uh, what I, you know, I'm starting to tell my students is that uh, we have a lot of different fields and we call things very differently. Mm -hmm. Right. And just like what Gordon was explaining, like you need to talk to many people. And and I've worked in many labs, uh, well, <laughs> relatively many labs. And, and at the foundry, especially, uh, we're a user facility. So back then, there were many collaborators coming from all around the world. So we, we I got to talk. It's just like conference, being in a conference every single day. <laughs> and what you start to realize is that uh, a lot of these names that people call things, they're all talking about the same thing. Uh, conceptually, they're talking about most of the time, especially in soft materials, thermodynamics. Yep. It all comes down <laughs> to thermodynamics. And so if you understand that language, it helps you understand uh, almost everything else, pretty much. <laughs> okay. So I would say the advice I have is the fundamentals. So stick to thermodynamics and, and relate everything back to that. And the other thing, actually, uh, to follow up on that is you mentioned uh, your experience at the molecular foundry at the UC, uh, the Berkeley National Lab. And, and when somebody hears about Berkeley, the first thing that comes to mind is the equipment that, uh, that you have there. You have the light source, you have all these other facilities. Uh, but you did not talk about that. You talked about people, right? So, so, so you talk about the people you're interacting with. Uh, Professor Leo also used to talk about meeting people, talking to people. Both of you are not talking about resources, the equipment you have. You're focusing on people. It, it, is it possible then for us to say the most powerful resource we have in science is not the equipment, but actually it's people? Is that a valid conclusion? That's a question for both of you. <laughs> Um, I think actually, um, I think both of these uh, people and the instruments are very important. But the instrument, instruments, they don't have any feeling. But for the people, they are actual human beings. I mean, I mean, this is dynamic. Uh, if we want to learn something, we have to uh, to, to to talk with people. I mean, yeah, because the, the, everybody has the brain, right? But instruments, if they have it, we can use it, uh, something like that. But definitely for the uh, current age of research, a uh, very uh, advanced instrument is really important uh, for our research. That is for sure. I mean, yeah. without this uh, uh, instrument, it is impossible to do this kind of uh, advanced this uh, research. For example, we uh, we are working on this uh, Parkinson's disease. We are working the animal model. Um, of course, you need to have some uh, the, 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 the smallest one is uh, just like a controller, right? Microcontroller. You need to like control your that, that, uh, uh, animal brain. Don't move when you do this kind of sensing. It's something like it's very mm -hmm. simple one. Right? And of course, we're using the confocal, right? If you don't have this kind of very sensitive device, it is impossible to generate higher quality data. So mm -hmm. after this kind of instrument, uh, especially for the cutting edge instrument, I mean, they are also very important to our research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry, I got cut off there for a bit, but um, I, I think the question, Martin, was it, uh, which one's more important, instruments or people? No, exactly. because all of you are talking about people, right? And, and, and I was expecting to say, oh, we had the molecular beam, we had this. We had... No, no, no. You're you're, all, both of you are talking about people. So to me, it's like being able to cross-pollinate ideas seems to be a really, really powerful uh, tool for, for, for science. And, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to hear your opinion about that. Yeah, no, I 100% I agree. And, uh, you know, everywhere I go, uh, when I talk to people on my experience, whether at conference or, or whether being at a foundry or even at Iowa State, 
I what I value most is the people I work with, uh, rather than the tools. Of course, I agree with Gordon. Tools without them were impossible to do anything. But uh, what keeps me going is you know, learning from others, because uh, mm-hmm. it's just impossible to learn everything on your own. That's that's my take on things. And there's always experts out there that has already thought about what you plan to do or has already solved the problem that you're trying to solve. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the greatest value would be to bring together these expertise and come up with something completely new. Yeah. Very, very, very good. So, so boys, uh, maybe I can come back to you and, and, and uh, ask the question, you know, you show this very beautiful self-assembled system and you're getting assembly at uh, very small dimensions. And coming from uh, Professor Lu's talk, I was just thinking about fluid transport. Could we use those assembled block polymer as a way of harvesting some of the some of the liquids that is really hard to access in, in clinical research? For example, could we pattern something like this and put it embed other like optical sensors components? Then you and Professor Ru can develop a completely new way of uh, soft materials that can weave through complex tissue and pull out uh, liquids for for analysis from really really difficult to reach. Places like the the brainstem, for example, is it possible? Definitely. Um, go, go ahead. <laughs> That's your question, <laughs> but I'm talking about this place. I do need your polymers, like a polymer blast, because we need to do anti folding for the in vivo monitoring. <laughs> yes. Exactly. That's, that was what I was going to follow up with. You yes. know, I wanted to, you know. I wanted to hear what you would say, and then we ask. We talk about anti folding. Uh, yes, that, yes. That is a big one. Yeah. yeah. Do you think you can apply them in that voice? Uh, I think we certainly should try. <laughs> mm-hmm. I I think that uh, the the field is really growing, and the major driver in this is semiconductor, of course, because there's a lot of money in it. Um, but I can definitely see it going other places, especially things like what Guochun is doing. Um, and a major advantage there compared to uh, traditional microfluidics is that these systems are designer systems you can mm-hmm. literally put you can functionalize the molecule however you want for anti-fouling purposes is one of them and the modulus of these materials are extremely soft and those are the kind of things we want to put in our body rather than uh hard materials yep yep and i, and I think also boys uh, because you can control the domain sizes very well you can also control where the liquid percolates and 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 uh, that can also uh, control how fast the liquid gets transported from the source to the end. So if you want to get a quick in and out, uh, it becomes very easy. And I think uh, it will be it will be wonderful to see something like that happen. Yeah, that's that's a great idea, man. <laughs> yep, very 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 good. So oh, fantastic. We we are getting at about eight ten uh, eight uh, eight ten here. So I'm uh, I'm. Unless anybody has a comment, I will move to the next step. All right, so uh, I want to thank uh, both of you for your presentation. And again, we are on virtual world these days, so I would like to present to you these virtual certificates. I, I promise you, if we're in person, Alice and I would have walked across the podium to hand this to you, but uh, for now, Please uh, accept the virtual certificates and thank you for being uh, our speakers today. This is for you, uh, Professor Liu, and boys, you'll be receiving this uh, uh, digitally. And with that, I want to uh, bring this uh, good talk session to an end. And I want to invite our colleagues who are in China to attend the Chinese version uh, that is happening um, on Tuesday next week. We will then uh, resume the following week with the English version of that. With that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.
再是奇迹，不再是幻想。此刻正感觉全世界离我鼓掌，不必太在意身旁惊奇的目光，可以点点头，可以放声歌唱。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想。我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞、啊，不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量。I can, I can， 你也能够像我一样飞。奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞、啊，不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的。心中无限的。